Hi, my name is Deborah, and I'm so glad to be here with all of you. Um, we're here today to talk about the Cultural New Deal, and I am just going to set the tone and introduce you to our amazing colleagues. Um, the Cultural New Deal is a call that was spearheaded by Arts Change US, the Center for Cultural Power, First Peoples Fund, the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, Race Forward, and SIP Culture. And it was collectively authored by many in order to address the fundamental question that we face now, which is whether we will emerge from this era choosing to maintain the same systems and beliefs that support the current climate, uh, current culture, excuse me, of division and death. Or if we will instead move forward toward a more just shared future guided by worldviews that foster collaboration and mutuality. Thousands of artists, arts and culture leaders have signed on. I think accurately, it's upwards of almost 2000. At its core, the Cultural New De Deal lays bare the cultural, structural and racial injustice that has resulted in death and in the deg degradation of lives, communities and our planet. The Cultural New Deal is a call to action that recognizes that artists, Black, indigenous, indigenous, Native American, and other artists of color, especially those who are disabled, deaf, and or LGBTQ plus IA, are working with their communities every day to create the conditions against this injustice, to generate health and well being. And we are here because communities are the best designers and the best leaders of their own systems and their own futures. So we're here today on the main stage of SOCAP, argue, arguably the biggest impact investment conversation in the world, because this conversation and this conference came into being to explore the intersection of money and meaning. And it stepped right into the center of an ongoing conversation about wealth, who holds it, and how it's used. But it has yet to blow open the system, to address the inequities, to redefine wealth, and to reimagine investment. And I'm joined by these three powerful people who were part of launching the Cultural New Deal. Carlton Turner from SIP Culture, Lori Poirier from First Peoples Fund, and Fabiana Rodriguez from the Center for Cultural Power. And we're here to tell you that artists drive meaning. They cultivate new social imaginaries. They help us come together and imagine new and better systems. Artists are the essential investors in their community. And we simply can't do impact investment without artists and their communities in the lead. So I would love to introduce you to these three people and to ask each of you to talk a little bit about how this came to be, why it's essential now, and what it means for us in terms of how we think about wealth. Um, I, had, I didn't actually uh, prepare, so I'm just going to call on you, Carlton, <laughs> and I hope you're cool with that. That's cool, but I'm going to pass it over to Fabi, actually, to, to do our intro and let her start. Fair enough. And then Lori, and I'll take, up the, the, I'll take the last. I always like to make sure that um, I, I invest in women leadership, so I'm going to go with Bobby and, and Lori. Thank you, Carlton. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, very happy to join you. Uh, I'm joining you from um, Ohlone Territory, also known as Oakland, California. Uh, I'm a lifelong resident of the Bay Area, grew up um, in Oakland, California, uh, during the era of the war on drugs, and so have really witnessed the ways uh, in which our communities have moved from um, huge divestment um, and, and really witnessing the intersections of many different things from uh, gentrification to the loss of artists um, in the Bay Area. And as a uh, artist, but also a leader in the arts, um, what the Cultural New Deal represents uh, is, is really reflect, the, reflecting the moment that we are in um, making a call for uh, cultural equity. And so I want to first talk about the moment we are in because I think that is really defining, uh, it is really the, 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 the foundation of why this call happened uh, at this time. Uh, we are at the intersection of four crises. Uh, the um, pandemic, of course, which is in itself a crisis, uh, not because the pandemic is killing people, but because people, the way people deal with the pandemic is killing overwhelmingly Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people. Uh, the second is um, the, uh, dis the kind of 
racial reckoning moment, the uprisings that we are in, uh, and, and, and a moment in which we are understanding how systems of oppression uh, are, are simply haven't been working, are not working, but are now highly visible and we're able to connect the dots. The third is the climate crisis, which also disproportionately has affected communities of color and especially indigenous communities. And the fourth is the economic crisis, uh, which we as communities of color know and have experienced for decades because of just divestment. So at that intersection, what's happening is also that there's a culture shift, um, a global culture shift, because the systems of the past, uh, whether that's capitalism or the way in which we cared for each other or simply our lack of health care, has uh, shown us that um, not only is another word possible, but uh, it's, it's here. Our moment to dismantle old systems um, is, is here. And as cultural workers, we know the power of ideas. We know the, that uh, in moments of chaos is precisely the time to lead with our vision. Uh, and we also know that because of economic crisis, that there are a lot of um, already relief programs or attempts at relief that are actually leaving communities of color out. And we saw that very clearly with how programs like PPP were rolled out. Um, so we are witnessing one of the largest transfers of white wealth through our government infrastructure. And so the Cultural New Deal is an intervention in that. It's um, a naming of um, our need to connect the dots that the same uh, forces that are polluting our communities are the same forces in, uh, investing in prisons. Um, and uh, as cultural workers, it's no longer uh, enough to say that we are uh, part of a community of artists. Uh, what's needed is that we have to um, demand investment uh, in our communities, in, in communities that have been impacted, because we recognize that culture precedes political change, that until we have the stories, we will not have the politics, that really policies, especially what we're witnessing now, are a consequence of an old story, a story that put um, profits before people and the planet. And so we are um, uh, calling on our uh, communities, calling on, on other uh, cultural organizations, really calling on the cultural sector at large to um, use this moment uh, to um, connect the dots and elevate really uh, BIPOC um, uh, leadership, but also to reimagine what our, our futures can look like. And I love that, you know, when we're talking about uh, wealth, um, we have to understand and recognize that the wealth that has been uh, built up in this country is the product of stolen land and stolen labor. And while that story is 400 to 500 years old, it continues to shape how our governments make decisions. Uh, and so what uh, another kind of fundamental aspect of uh, the Cultural New Deal is that we, we name that. We name that um, in this moment of history, we, we, we can't move forward without truth and reconciliation. Uh, and that um, in order for us to continue to thrive and to be able to shape uh, the, our, our, our systems of governance and how resources are allocated, that culture has to be uh, at the center of that. Uh, so I hope I, I captured everything. Um, Carlton and Lori, maybe you could uh, fill in wherever I, I missed. Beautifully done. Lori, do you want to jump in? I'm Peitu Ashke Mikaki Api Makasi from the Omani Wi. I'm Lori, I'm Oglala Lakota, and I'm calling from the um, Hesapa, the Black Hills here in um, Rapid City, South Dakota. And um, thanks, Bobby, for that, that great introduction on the Cultural New Deal. And I think one of the areas that um, you know, I would like to just um, focus on is the Cultural New Deal, you know, has just this really um, awesome opening. Um, we are the artists, the culture bearers, the healers of spirits, the first responders to community soul. So I just want to lift up those culture bearers in this conversation. We've held um, listening sessions with the um, tradition, um, tradition makers of tribal communities of um, communities that have migrated to this country that have been forced off their homelands that are in this country right now that are sustaining culture, sustaining their history and um, sustaining their artwork and their art practices. 
Um, and one of the things that I think that really grounds the Culture New Deal and the work that um, we're doing in our communities and that is critically important is to sustain those values, you know, of integrity, of um, what First Peoples Fund calls the collective spirit, which is that which moves each one of us to stand up and make a difference or si simply extend a hand of generosity. And so there's 573 nations in this country. There's about 60 urban It appears that we're having technical issues. And this, are we okay? We lost you there for a minute, uh, Lori. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think we'll be okay um, because we can do some editing afterwards. Okay, so what I wanted to just say is that uh, tribal nations, there's 573 nations in this country and more than um, 60 urban Indian, Indian communities in the um, um, larger cities. And the only thing that I wanted to add was that tribes are sovereign nations in this country. And I think it's an important critical time to this cultural new deal to let the tribal communities lead, to um, acknowledge our tribal sovereignty in this country, and to acknowledge that we are the protectors and the caretakers of this land. And um, we will continue to do the work of, of healing in our communities and um, restoring and rebuilding our tribal nations. Thank you, Lori. Carlton, do you wanna jump in? Yeah. Um, Thank you, um, Deborah. Thank you, SoCal, for this opportunity. And um, much love to my comrades, uh, Favi and Lori, for their work. I want to start with reading two uh, particular passages from the Cultural New Deal that I think are very important. Um, my name is Carlton Turner first, um, and I am from uh, Utica, Mississippi, where my family has been uh, for eight generations. We are on the land of the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Natchez, and the Yazoo people. Um, and what I want to read is, two particular paragraphs from the Cultural New Deal. And it says, we recognize that this nation was founded on stolen land and built by stolen labor. Free in the land means the return of indigenous lands. We acknowledge that any work we do in the name of justice and healing of this planet must start with respect and support for indigenous peoples, their knowledge and their right to self-determination and tribal sovereignty. We also acknowledge our indebtedness to the movement for black freedom and to Black freedom culture, which articulates our dreams of liberation and makes them tangible and imaginable. We will not be free until Black people are free. We stand in defense of Black lives. I think it's important to highlight those two pieces because one, um, the Cultural New Deal is not about some futuristic space that we need to be operating in. It is the baseline and the fundamental strategies we need to be operating in to have um, an equitable community, uh, to have a community that is based on the principles I think that we hold uh, as culture bearers. The work of the Cultural New Deal, uh, as Fabi said, is about responding to this moment that we're, we're existing in, this the confluence of these four pandemics, these four crises that we're living through. Um, and and this, this Cultural New Deal was about really focusing on um, continued support for artists to, to have jobs, to keep arts and cultural organizations open, but not uh, just to keep the economy going, but to recognize that in many of these communities, these cultural institutions and these artists are the lifeline of the communities that they serve. Um, they are on the front lines. They are the first responders. They are the spaces. I think about um, Ache Cultural Arts Center uh, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina uh, and that space as a, a cultural, hub for the city of, of New Orleans, it became uh, the, the central um, information station. It became the place where people were organizing where food and cleaning supplies and cleanup efforts. Um, that was the art. The art was about rebuilding the community. Uh, and in this moment of economic crisis, racial strife, uh, the pandemic, COVID, the climate issues, it's artists and the cultural institutions and organizations that are helping to re um, structure and reformulate and reimagine how these communities will, will, will survive and thrive in the future. Um, I think this, we had this opportunity that you talked about, Deborah, in the beginning um, to kind of rebuild um, 
things as they were and to, to get back to this idea of normalcy um, or to be visionary and transformative in the way that we think about our futures to actually build something that represents where we want to be, uh, the world that we deserve to live in. Uh, and I think that the cultural new deal is about framing uh, the, the space for that conversation uh, to, to create an opportunity for imagination to lead the way uh, and not feel like we're tethered to the way that we have done things. We've already seen that there's an opportunity to do things differently. Uh, and with the cultural new deal, we think that we can begin moving in a direction to change our future uh, through through leading with a different set of, of, of uh, a different idea of how we can formulate ourselves around the structures that have been serving us um, less than what we deserve. Um, and so we want to to lead and move in a different type of way. It's it's so powerful. Um, and and there's something that you all are, are raising up that I feel is so important. And it's this thing about like people always saying, well, we can't come out of this you know, the, the, this population of people, these people will be left behind. And what, you're, what we're really talking about here is kept behind, not left behind, but kept behind. And until we acknowledge that, and until black people are free, none of us are free. And so there's this kind of interdependence and interconnectedness that you are pushing forward. And for me, even though I work in the cultural sector, it's a blueprint for society. It's a set of demands for all of us. It needs to be mainstreamed. And um, what I hope the SOCAP audience understands is that what you all have done didn't start with a pandemic. This is decades and generations of work. Um, and what I'm seeing is the slightest bit of wind at your backs, right? Like the slightest bit where in the arts and culture sector, things are changing. Not enough, not everywhere, but it is a call to action. So I wonder if I could just in, in inspire you all to talk a little bit about how this is about a societal change. And at Carlton, you're already getting at how organizations like Ashe and your organization are at the center of community rebuilding and reimagining. This is putting power in the hands of the people who are hardest hit by these inequities. So maybe talk a little bit about how we shift power, why this is bigger than the arts and culture sector, but also why it has to start with those who are the artists and culture bearers. So I'm gonna throw it back. Fabi, could I, could I get you to start? Sure, sure. Um, I think like, you know, I wanna I want present two examples of, of why this is actually um, really fundamentally about a change that is needed for all, all communities. Um, and, and I'll point to the climate crisis. Um, the, the idea of extraction, the idea of endless extraction um, from the planet, which is now putting us at a crisis that threatens all of us, all human beings, uh, is, is something really is, is a model that was um, imported to this land through colonization, right? So the idea of exploiting uh, the land, of exploiting animals and exploiting workers is really an idea that has now led us to um, almost a, a place of no return. And if you look at the global level of, of who is doing the best job at protecting the world's biodiversity, it's indigenous communities. Indigenous communities are literally blocking fossil fuel projects. Um, they are uh, standing up for really the rights of mother earth. And it's not, it's, it's not something separate, it's a world view that we do not extract that we work in partnership. Uh, we are now at a time when all the signs in front of us point, point that the, the system of extraction is, is leading to irreparable damage. I mean, the wildfires were experiencing um, the in, in increasing temperatures. And unless we um, really center indigenous sovereignty in our climate work, we're not going to we, we we're not going to solve the climate crisis because what this is about is not just rethinking where we get our energy. It's about reimagining and and actually re, re, returning to a very different relationship to nature. And so if we you know I, I think the, the the climate crisis is something that I think so easily people all of us can can agree uh, that um, we we have to pivot and actually accelerate towards uh, different approaches 
uh, and, 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 and that's centered in indigenous leadership. But the second one I'll say uh, is that, let's take the California, for example. The number one people dying in California are Latinx people. California, uh, Latinx people make up almost 40% of this state. Uh, we are practically invisible in um, Hollywood. This past year, uh, there was no nominations of uh, Latinx um, television content in the major categories in the Emmys, just like there was massive invisibility of indigenous communities. It can't be that in California, um, Latino workers are good enough to feed the country because you know, as the fifth largest economy, Latinx workers are responsible for feed for two thirds. Two thirds of the food that is coming out of California is feeding the country. It can't be that uh, we are um, literally part of the backbone of the economy, and yet that we our stories are not presented back to us. Because what that does, it creates the conditions so that our farm workers are not protected. I mean, they're out there working despite you know the smoke, despite the pandemic. Uh, the reason why Latinos are the number one dying in this state is because Latinos are essential workers, right? And so we can't have an economic system that um, values life so little that is, it, it actually is, it, it, it's creating a, a, a huge problem because in, in, you know, in, in places like LA where Latinx people um, are nearly half the city and are making up the massive amounts of COVID infections, what we're seeing is that our systems of, um, of the systems of racial disparity are actually increasing our health crisis, right? right? And so we have to re-examine that why, how did we arrive at a place where we can put um, you know, Latinx and indigenous families in cages, because a lot of these folks migrating who are in detention centers and are getting separated are indigenous from the South. Uh, how did we arrive here? Well, I, I can tell you that in 1994, here in the state of California, we were, this is where the anti-immigrant nativist movement was born. And it was through Proposition 187, an anti-immigrant law. And so we can't disconnect culture from politics. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the narratives now that are about border militarization, deporting, the anti-immigrant sentiment is largely based in anti-immigrant stories, culture. It's a cultural problem. And so we can't move towards solutions until we first are grounded in a different kind of story, right? Yeah. Which is yeah. a story of belonging, a story of um, uh, which families also, the, you know, it, it, it's, it really is around which bodies um, uh, we can incarcerate, marginalize, allow to get sick and die, and which bodies are worthy of saving. And I think that that is at the core of our conversation is that we have to shift towards a culture in which um, we are all thriving and we matter and our health matters. And it, yeah. start, it starts with the arts. So beautiful. So, so we don't have a whole lot of time left. And what I, what I keep hearing, and Carlton, I remember this from you participating in YBCA's um, uh, series, um, Alchemy of the Reset, where you said something like, and I probably won't get it right, you said something like, innovation is the act of remembering. And, and you know what I'm hearing is, it starts with remembering, it starts with making visible, it starts with culture. No productive investment, or no investment will be productive if we don't start with remembering, start with making visible, and start with culture. And Lori, I feel like, um, you know, this is, this is the work that you do. Um, and so I'd love for you to reflect on that and maybe we can pass it off to Carlton then. Yeah, one of our elders, um, well, she's not really an elder, she's closer to my age, um, from Klukwan, which is a village in Alaska of 100 people, said yesterday, violence to the earth equates violence against our bodies, and that her daughter reminded her of that in um, an article that she was reading because they're just fighting to um, save their salmon right now. And she said, you know, most indigenous peoples, when th those food systems that sustain them don't exist anymore, um, in the case of wild salmon in her community, they don't exist as a people because everything about what makes us as human beings, you know, what sustains us as indigenous peoples, if we can't feed ourselves from our land, if we can't gather foods from our land, if our weavers aren't able to, um, you know, gather um, 
practice their gathering rights. California is an example. All of the weavers cared for the land there. They had their own controlled burned ways of practicing and caring for the land. And I think it was in the 60s or 70s, they started getting by, um, um, charges against them. And same with the Oregon coast uh, where Bud Lane, a uh, uh, Siletz tribal leader is from, who serves on our board of directors. You know, he said, we walk on this land different. We teach our children as we're walking on the land, what are the medicines, what are the food system, what, what supplies us? And we have done that for since time immemorial. And they're the ones who were, you know, forced off all that timber that doesn't exist anymore in, in North, um, in Oregon, that was their indigenous homelands. And so I think it's time for people to also recognize, I talked about sovereignty earlier, you know, it's time for people to recognize and um, um, understand our histories. You know, you talked in your question about uh, the historical trauma and health and how do we sustain ourselves. You know, if we can't feed ourselves off this land, um, you know, if we can't take care of Unchi Maka, Mother Earth, Grandmother Earth, we're not going to exist as a peoples as all of us. So we have to live and practice, practice those values of caring for um, of the earth and the land and indigenous peoples from the tip of uh, Canada to the tip of Mexico have practiced those since time immemorial. So people need to pause, listen, and, and um, let indigenous folks lead in this healing of this earth. Um, yeah. Carlton, can I ask you to chime in? Sure. Yeah, I think uh, this idea of, of, of um, remembrance as, as the innovative practice uh, is, is what Lori is saying. Uh, so many of these challenges that we're, we're holding up as the, in, the intractable challenges of our time are challenges that have already been solved by indigenous communities. Um, you know, the, they aren't really problems. They're just about changing the way that we approach living, the way we approach our relationship with our environment, with our community, with our neighbors. Um, that is where the change, the transformative change that has to happen that will alter our course and our trajectory. And our relationship um, means that we'll have a different quality of life in the future. Uh, right now, uh, our lives are measured by how much money we're able to accumulate how many possessions and resources we are able to hoard and, 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 and that's how our, our worth is determined. And so the wealthiest people are the people who have the most resources hoarded. Uh, and, and that hoarding of resources is impacting the quality of life for the entire planet. Uh, and we can't dissect these things away from each other. Um, this work is not new. Um, Favi, myself, Lori, we're all part of generations of movement builders, of, of people who were working for a different type of future. Um, and that, all of that information went into the way that we thought about this particular call. Um, it was influenced by the Native American arts and culture, by the Harlem Renaissance, by the Black arts movement, by the Chicano arts movement, by the Asian American arts movement, by organizations like the New World Theater, um, like um, you know, Free Southern Theater, the Black Cultural Front, I mean, these are all things that have inspired us and also informed our understanding. Um, so we're not moving in, um, we're not moving in the dark. Our work is informed by those that came before us that laid the, the pathway and, and set us up to, to have the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom uh, to move collectively. Uh, it's not, um, it's not, it's we're working in an intercultural space we're not working um oh oh fabi's doing her thing over there with the latinx people well you know it's good what they're doing no we need to know what they're doing we need to be supporting their work so that we're we're working in alignment with each other the work of indigenous people it's not enough to just tell us where your land whose land you're you're on um it's up to us to to create space so that indigenous people can lead in the ways that they know how to lead on this land. And we have to take our cues from that leadership because our sovereignty, our, our liberation is tied up in their sovereignty. Right. Uh, and so these are really important notions for us uh, to be in relationship with each other as kinship um, and, and work to support each other in ways uh, that our forefathers and generations before us were trying to 
but we're, aren't a, we're unable to see through to fruition. We have to pick that up and, and march it all uh, as far as we can for the next generation to continue to work until we have a, a future that uh, represents the one that we, we deserve for all of our people. That was beautiful. And I think with, with that, I want to make sure to thank you all for the way in which you are influencing the work. Your Buena Center for the Arts is listening. We are shifting, we are changing. Um, we have a cohort of artists here, Black and Native artists here at SOCAP that we've been working with leading up to it. They have a big, wild idea and they're gonna be pitching it. And this is about shifting power. This is about investing in remembrance, investing in making visible and investing in our true leaders who are right here among us. So thank you for your beautiful words and for your time and thank you to SOCAP. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Plamaya.